In today's episode, I want to walk through the steps of what it took to recreate this little quadcopter arm in CAD so that I could reproduce it on a 3D printer. So to do this, what I ended up using was a camera. I just used my phone right here, a pair of calipers because you need to have some sort of measurement that's going to be nice and accurate. And then I used Fusion 360. Now, there's lots of cameras, there's other things besides calipers, and Fusion 360 is not the only program that can do this. The first step I did, let me just roll back in history here, is I inserted an image. So that's right up here, we're under the Model tab. So I went right down there, I could just insert an image, and what that's going to do is it's going to put it on a plane. You can see that I'm on the top plane right here. So that would just be this one. It tends to work best if you work from the top down. So that I created this, I, I sh put this canvas inside of here. Now it will give you some scale options. So I need to know something of reference of how big it is. So I know what this grid pattern is back here. The, each one of these blocks is a quarter of an inch. So what I ended up doing was creating a sketch. You can see it right here. And that's one inch by one inch. So I'm just going to count out four tiles. The further, bigger you can go, the more accurate your measurements will be. But in this case, it'd be kind of a pain in the butt to line up more stuff than that. And once I got that in position, I started to model things out and, and started to just work on the sketch itself, knowing that this is going to be a, a just a circle and I wanted to work off the origin. So I, what I ended up doing was taking this image and I, I moved it around just using this block right here. So that moves it around and then this right here will scale it. And then once you get really, really close, you can just start pointing in point decibels over here just to get it really accurate. Now, one thing you'll notice right off the bat here is that this image isn't really 100% accurate. Now, this has to do with how the cameras work and what camera you're using. So the camera on your cell phone, or at least my cell phone, has a very wide angle of view. So therefore, the curvature of the glass affects how the image looks. Uh, when you actually take a picture. So if we're, if I just hide this sketch right here, you can see how right here you can see there's a bit of a shadow. And then on this side, you can also see there's a shadow right there. Now that's not a shadow, that is actually just the hole. Uh, it's, be, it's actually seeing the side of the hole, but it's wrapping it around. So the image is actually warped. To get around this, you might want to use something like a photo scanner. So, or a photocopier, essentially, and then you just scan it. The reason a scanner works a little bit better is because it's taking a orthographic, orthographic image of what's on there. It's, it's scanning it line by line, so it's not trying to take something from the, the glass, which is trying to project out like your eyeball and then lay it flat on a sheet. It's actually just scanning flatly across the sheet, a lot like a, a, any other scanner technology would work. So that will give you a more accurate starting position than what I had on, on this guy right here. Now I didn't use the scan image. I actually just modeled it like this to begin with because my, <laughs> my printer wasn't really working. So the other thing that I do when I'm, I'm doing something like this, which is can be in, in all different formats. You can have, you know, you could actually have a document that you need to recreate some floor plans and pull some geometry into your model or whatever it is. Um, the other thing you also have to understand is that on the other end of this project, right, whoever made this part had to logically think through how they were going to make it. So if the dimension is completely weird and completely off the wall, there's a good chance that that isn't the right dimension. I'm not saying that it isn't like that, but try to think through it logically. If if this over here, if I have to figure out, okay, what is the possible angle right there? There's some ways to figure it out, but I could guesstimate pretty darn close that it's going to be a round number, 25 degrees. These corners, 90 degrees. The distance between you know, certain features right here, eight millimeters. Not that I can actually measure exactly eight millimeters, right? I can only get so accurate with my, with my tool here. So there's no real shortcut to this process because essentially what you're doing here is you're you're measuring some known dimensions that are easy to measure and you can put that in the drawing accurately and then you're tracing an image and kind of using that as a reference point 
to guesstimate and then using some logic after that if you just have no more accurate information. So once again, that's why having an image that comes from a scanner is a little bit better than actually working with an image that's warped. Because you can see right here, this arm, because of the way it was warped, I accidentally made it a little bit too short. Now I actually found this out when I put it on my drone and the, the, the blades were a little bit closer than I thought they were with the original arms. So if I make that another 0.5 millimeters, that's looking ah, uh, that is looking awfully close right there. I'm just working on this area down here to try to bring it in a little bit closer. Bingo. So that dimension there, that was that was right. 3.5 right there. <laughs> this really is just a game of how close can you get the lines, right? So now, just out of curiosity, if I go from that to that, that is 84.1. And if I measure that with my calipers, so my calipers here are saying 84.16. So I'd say that's pretty close. So that's the method I used to recreate that model in CAD and then I just put that over here into Cura in order to make that a 3D printed part that I could put on the drone. So let's say this was the shape I wanted right there. All I do at this point is I come down here to the body, right click, hit save as STL, and I always keep the the range quite, a, quite dense actually just because I find that um, this just works well for me and getting nice smooth round corners and everything right here. Now as for the material I'm using in this project, I'm using uh, 3DX Tech carbon fiber. So this is their nylon version. And you can see the flextural modulus right here is 3750. That's basically how resistant it is to flexing. So that would be this one right here and how how much it wants to do that number. Now the thing about nylon is that it does absorb moisture. So in this document right here, essentially what it's talking about is that as nylon is absorbing moisture, its mechanical properties tend to change a little bit. It becomes a little less stiff and a little bit more ductile, so it can actually bend a little bit, which makes it a tougher material, but less stiff. So I'm not 100% sure if this number here is based off a dry sample, like you would get right out of the 3D printer, because this stuff is very, very dry when you print it, um, or if it's after it's been out and about in the atmosphere for, you know, a couple days absorbing moisture. And that will also depend on where you're at, you know, what the climate is like in the area that you would be flying uh, this drone armor, or wherever you'd be using this material. The thing is, there's not a lot of documentation that I know of that tells me what this mechanical property would be in the given environment. So unfortunately, I don't know a lot more than that. I'm not a real expert on this topic, but I have taken uh, nylon samples, not carbon fiber, but nylon samples, and put them in 100% water and just had it absorb moisture, and you could feel the difference, you know, between that and then right off the 3D printer. So uh, I've heard that, and I've also heard some other engineers talking about how they've put parts out into the field, but there was at 120 degrees Fahrenheit with 100, you know, 90 something humidity and the parts began to fail because it was a fair bit softer. So it's something to keep in mind. So one last thing about the carbon fiber nylon is that I, I kind of thought that this would be kind of the ideal material because it's stiff, right? But after it kind of absorbs some moisture, it should be able to take an impact, a little bit of an impact, right? And then bounce back without breaking, at least that's what I think it should be able to do. But there's other materials that are available to us in the carbon fiber range. There's also just tons and tons of other materials out there. I'm not going to go over all of them, but let's take a look at some other carbon fiber stuff. PLA being an easy one to print. And I can't think of a lot of good reasons to use carbon fiber PLA, except for maybe this reason, because you want stiffness. So there you have it, 6,320. That's very, very stiff. In about the same range is 
carbon fiber polycarbonate and carbon fiber PETG. The PETG has a lower tensile strength, uh, but the stiffness is about the same when comparing those two. So a PETG should actually be able to be printed on quite a few 3D printers without like maybe an enclosure, maybe? <laughs> I don't know, I never tried it. But the polycarbonate material uh, it definitely is one of those that's going to be a little bit more demanding to print because your extrusion temperature is much higher than you would have with the PETG. So I would say, you know, the first three are probably doable without an enclosure. I do have a heated enclosure and I had to put this much brim around when I added the extra side onto this. So, you know, it's trying to pull up off the bed. So you, you add the brim around it to kind of keep it stuck to the bed. But this stuff prints really, really good. And the temperature of the environment that I was printing at was right around 40 C for this material. On the very high end range, if you're just looking for super high performance and super stiffness, you have the PEEK material with a tensile strength of 105 and then a stiffness of 8,300. I would like to be able to print this stuff. It's very demanding on a 3D printer, right? As far as what you have here and some of the conditions you have to meet as far as being able to print the material out of the nozzle and clearing the nozzle so that it doesn't cause you a lot of heartache when it dries in the nozzle. And not only that, the material itself is definitely not cheap at all. By comparison to how stiff some, like let's say if this is 3K carbon sheet, which I think it is, uh, we're still dealing with materials that are you know, anywhere from 27 to 60 times more flexible, if my math is right, than a carbon fiber plate, which is machined here. So there's definitely some things to consider when it comes to the actual engineering and design of, of replacing a part like this is that it, it does have to match close enough the stiffness as we saw there because the, the vibrations that go through the frame affect the gyroscopes and all the tuning that you have inside of that uh, quadcopter. When you're looking up filaments, what you want to look for is the technical data sheet. Because what that will give you is uh, the actual properties of that you know, test, like we have right here, which is based on ISO standard standardized testing. So this is apparently a technical data sheet, but it's no longer found. So I'm going to use the Wayback Machine and see if I can find its historical data. Ha! Got it! Can't hide nothing. So this is PC Max from Polymaker, and this stuff is about as high-end you can print on, let's say, like a hobby-end uh, 3D printer. So it's... Yeah, nozzle temperatures are, are like 275, and the bed is about as hot as you can get it but it has some good properties and it does not contain carbon fiber so you don't need to have a special nozzle. This is probably what you'd end up using. Let's see what we have here. Okay, we can see the bending modulus right here and this is the ISO 178. That's the same one that we had over here, ISO 178. And we can see that it has a 2044 uh, megapascals. So that right there is is not equivalent to anything that has carbon fiber in film. Although its tensile strength is very very good. You're looking at 59.7 and that's really what, you know, that and its resistance to temperature is what makes PC Max so impressive. On one final note is the offsets that I end up using when it comes for 3D printing. Uh, so the thing about when you print a hole in, uh, off a 3D printer, it tends to print a little bit beyond the dimension that you give it. So I end up offsetting by default on the diameter 0.2 millimeters. That tends to get me pretty close. Um, on these smaller holes, you kind of got to play around with that a little bit more than that. But that's the rough number I tend to work with because it tends to print over that line just a little bit as it's squishing out the material. That also depends on how the layer height. And when you're printing in carbon fiber, you tend to use higher layer heights of roughly 60% of the nozzle 
diameter in height is what they recommend, which is a fair bit different than when you're using a material that is just a doesn't have any additives in it. Where I might print at 0.15 millimeters if I'm using PC Max, I print in carbon fiber at 0.25 millimeters. So there you have it, the nitty gritty details of just turning something like this into the same thing but 3D printed. There's a lot that goes into it and there's a ton to cover uh, on all of these subjects. And that's what really makes 3D printing for me so fascinating because it's just that, that connection between all of these tools that I end up using all day, every day, and you can just do so much with it. So it's a great learning opportunity. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this com uh, content, let me know down there in the description below. And if you got some questions or some expertise that you want to throw my way, feel free to let me know down there as well. If I've earned your subscription, then thank you so much for that. Have a great day, guys. Stay awesome.